Are we ready, Sean? We are ready. Thank you. Very good. Okay, once again, welcome everybody to the uh, third in our series of six webinars regarding advancing recovery. We're very excited to have you all back. And um, as with our other topics, we're very excited to be presenting today on this one, which is focused on um, uh, selecting and supporting goals. Uh, the same, we'll have many of the same presenters, but I'm happy to say that we also have the addition of Allie Mabry from the University of Kansas, who's uh, deeply experienced in both how to conduct strength assessments and all the aspects of the strength model, but also uh, a, a trainer and developer of it. So uh, we're very excited to have her a part of this session. And you may recall, if you are on the session last time, that we didn't get a chance to hear from Gloria Frederico about what San Francisco Behavioral Health Services is doing with the strengths model and specifically the strength assessment. So we're going to start out um, today with a bit about that. You still have the opportunity, as we did with last time, to gain continuing ed education credits. I want to let you know that um, we're, we are short-staffed currently in our department. Um, back at CIBHS, in this department who supports the pack packaging and processing of, of requests, and therefore we're behind. So if you haven't received your packet yet from session two, you still will. Um, we're just a bit behind, and we're, we're in the process of staffing up, and so things will speed up. Um, but for now, you're, you're welcome to submit again for CEs for this session um, while you're also waiting if you haven't received it for your packet from the last session. Some instructions you need to put into the questions, uh, the name and email of each individual who will be requesting educational credit. This must be done within the first 15 minutes. And then, of course, you need to attend the entire session and then complete the CE packet once it is, uh, once you have received it. So we, we hope that this, between now and the next webinar, uh, we're able to get both packets out and get caught up. Uh, but we are, as an organization, just understaffed uh, temporarily in this area. So apologize for those delays. Uh, moving into our session agenda, uh, following these introductions, we are going to do a brief review of the strength assessment. And uh, we will um, hopefully get a little bit of feedback from uh, folks who have given it a try. And as well as uh, we'll be you know, getting a review from Rick about the strength assessment uh, and from Glory Frederico about how they're using it in San Francisco. And then Rick is going to help link the strength assessment, SA, to the personal recovery plan, which is a big focus of today's call. And we call it the PRP. So he's going to start out by linking how the strength assessment and the PRP work together to support recovery. And then he'll spend time going into depth about the personal recovery plan, what it is, how you do it. Um, and then he and Allie will team up on talking about why goals are not achieved, what, what's tricky about um, goals, and, uh, and how we can so often see a lack of progress towards them versus what we can do um, to reverse that and actually gain the progress that we seek. Uh, Allie's going to give us quite a bit of um, just on the ground guidance about how do you use the PRP day to day? What makes it real and effective day to day? So it's going to give us a real operational view of the PRP. Uh, and then Rick will give us a good summary and we'll wrap up and set the stage for next session's agenda. Uh, another reminder about the Strengths Model Practice Orientation Scale. We'll be focusing on item one and three. Uh, last time we did also focus on item one, so that client centered goal identification and achievement was part of last session, very central to today's session, as is item number three, goal planning. Uh, now, we're asking you to keep these in mind. We are going to um, ask for your all participants who completed a scale to submit their uh, scores for session six, because we'll be discussing uh, the big picture uh, during session six about how you bring all these pieces together and then really move across that scale to the level of uh, strength model orientation that, or strength practice orientation that you would like as an organization and, and certainly as an individual practitioner. So generally speaking, we want you to you know, help use the scale to build awareness of where you are versus where you want to be. Uh, as always, we have Rick Gosha as our lead presenter. Um, we've gotten to know him well, and, and no doubt for those that have heard him for the last few sessions, he's uh, you know, deeply knowledgeable and experienced in the strength model. He was a co-developer of it with Charles Rapp, and he's been instrumental in much of the work that we've been doing for years here in California to bring the strengths model um, to uh, providers throughout the state. 
Uh, Rick has, as I suggested earlier, recruited a colleague of his, Ali Mabry, who works in his um, his center and has really kind of done it all when it comes to the strengths model. Rick, I'm going to turn it over to you now to see um, uh, if you wouldn't yep. mind going ahead and introducing Ali. Yeah, it's it, Ali's a, a fairly modest person, but uh, since she can't speak right now, I just want to say that she's probably the uh, the, the, the most uh, proficient uh, strengths model practitioner that, that I've ever experienced, and not only from just uh, just knowing the model so much in depth, but how she teaches it on the ground here and actually leads all of our evidence-based practice implementation. So she's really good at getting these things moving, working within agencies. And um, I know you're only going to get just one little bit of taste of her uh, today, um, but the things that uh, she can talk about related to this model are just pretty profound. She's um, you know, done. I was looking at hers. She's pretty much done a lot of the same things that I've done. She's, uh, you know, started off as a case manager. She was a supervisor. She's directed a, a program, but she's also been the um, a former assistant director of the, a large uh, urban community mental health center. And she's really doing a lot to help expand Strengths Model even more. And just a few of those is um, developing Strengths Model for use with with children and youth, and then also adults with co-occurring substance use disorders. So definitely has taken the model and just continues to keep pushing it. So Karen uh, had mentioned that um, we had some people that tried uh, using the strengths assessment. So I'd love to hear from you all, um, anyone who, uh, who was able to do that, and tell us what your experiences were. Uh, Rick, I'm going to go ahead and, and take uh, Marilyn Stringer off mute. And Marilyn, if you feel like uh, feel comfortable sharing your experience, I would love for you to do that. Sure. Um, so I have a, a relatively new client who seems to be functioning pretty well, but I believe it was Rick who said last month that not uh, everyone who uses this model is necessarily working with people who uh, in the past we didn't think would recover, you know, that it can be used for a lot of different clients. So I just decided to use it with this woman. I talked to her about it one month, one week, and the next week I brought a copy for her and one for me. And so um, what she's been struggling with, she's a mother, a wife, she has two young children, uh, she's had pretty severe depression and postpartum depression in the past. Is doing better now and is kind of looking for the next thing in her life. So she chose to look at employment, uh, that area of the assessment. And it really led to a great discussion about how she felt kind of like a fraud, that even the things that she was able to call strengths or past experience. She was discounting and saying, but I was in this place and you know maybe they would have taken anyone to do this work. Maybe it didn't really count. So it was just a really good uh, discussion starter and a great way to break down a barrier. Great, great to hear it. Um... Hopefully, a lot of you are getting a chance to be able to do this. You know, I, I I think there's so many different situations that you can apply this whole thing in. But you know, for me, always you know, doing the strengths with some with someone is kind of like sometimes just stepping into the unknown or stepping into attention. And um, and sometimes you, you can be very pleasantly surprised at what can come out of that. Um, just to open up the dialogue with people. I think is a, is a good start. Yeah, that's so, exactly what it did. Good. Any other uh, experiences, um, Karen? Yes, uh, uh, we have Maria Gregg from Momentum. Amanda, you are off uh, mute. Amanda? Double check mute on your end. OK, we're obviously having a little sound trouble there, so let's move on from that, but maybe uh, Amanda and Maria, you can chat in or tie or put into questions your feedback, and we'll we'll be sure to come back to it. 
Well, someone who's also spent some time, uh, you know, testing this uh, strengths assessment and actually other aspects of the model is Gloria Federico, and she's had teams that have participated in two different learning sessions, uh, advancing recovery collaboratives, and um, has had lots of unique experiences from different sides of it, of, uh, of using the strengths assessment and, and working with others who are using it. So we, uh, hopefully we're going to have Gloria last time. It didn't work out, but uh, Gloria, you're on. Thank you, Rick. Well, I was really happy today to um, share some about the experience of San Francisco. It was really in 2011 that San Francisco really decided to make a commitment to better understand uh, the best practices for advancing recovery within our system. And we first started by participating in one of the learning collaboratives. And we had two clinics who were participating. At that point, I was the assistant director at OMI Family Center, and I was asked to be the team lead. And um, what we were tasked with was basically to try to learn some new practices. And OMI Family Center is probably much like many of um, the clinics where those of you who are listening are working. Uh, we're an outpatient clinic. We served about 700 clients. And I would say that we had a really dedicated hard-working staff, and if you ask them individually, they would say, yeah, of course, we want all of our clients to recover. But what we found is that really we really were practicing uh, much, much as a private practice. Each clinician was uh, helping their clients recover in their own unique way. Um, we weren't really coming together and learning as a team. So what we were really asking was to try something different and to try to learn some new tools, some new practices to further advance this recovery. And so what we did, we didn't, we didn't dare roll this out to the whole clinic, because that would just be really too overwhelming. We first um, formed a small group, and we made a commitment to meet weekly. And I think this is key, is setting aside the time to really explore what it's like to actually try something new. Because for many of us, we've been doing our clinical work, having great success you know, for many, many years, and now we're asking people to try something new. And in order to really, I think, make staff feel comfortable about taking the time to learn something new, you really have to have the buy-in from upper management. And I have to say we're really lucky that we had the support of all of our executive leaders. So what we did first is that we really first learned the strengths assessment. Each week, we would think about how we're going to try it this week. Somebody might try it at intake. Somebody might try it um, during the time when we're doing our annual treatment plan of care. So the variations were many. And every single time we learned something, sometimes were successes, sometimes were failures. But it was actually the failures that we actually learned something. And meanwhile, while we're testing out the strengths assessment, I was also in a management role at the clinic. I was the assistant director. And I also knew, too, that we have to, rather than us working in our own silo, that we, and me as a manager, had to really think about how can we begin to show or actually express in the clinic that things were a little different here. And so we started some really simple practices. And that was really, the first thing we did was really at, um, when I started asking for successes. And these could be client successes, staff successes, we later expanded it to be moments of gratitude that we wanted to express to other team members. And this was very powerful. It sounds really, really simple on the surface, but this was so powerful. And I think what really made it fun, and you know, people always tease me that I'm a bit of a cheerleader, but is to really whoop it up and make it a big deal. And what if you if you if you're willing to take the risk and try something like this, you're gonna see that you're going to change, the energy is going to change in the room, the staff are going to be more engaged, and if you start talking about successes, you're going to find it's going to start appearing in people's paperwork, in their assessments. So you really have to make an effort as a leader to continue to bring the message of recovery and continue to bring it into the dialogue that we have every day at our clinics. Another thing that we did to show that something was different is we began to really work on um, how, what is our messaging to our clients? What does our waiting room look like? Is it welcoming? We embarked on a, a Tree of Hope project, which was really 
a wonderful, it was a very simple project, but it was one in which we put a tree up in the waiting room and we had leaf and we asked each client who came into our uh, client or, or visitor who came in if they wanted to write down a strength that they felt was really important to them that helped them build up their own hope. And something about this tree, it really resonated with a lot of people. And, and it's, it was a very simple statement, but very powerful. We also began to work on how do we actually welcome our clients? How do we make people uh, feel welcome when they first enter into our clinic? Are we thanking people for choosing us, for getting their services here at our clinic? And we really started messaging with our front desk staff is how do we continue to keep that message going, that we're happy people chose us and that we really believe as a team that we can help them move along on their path of recovery. So we were in the collaborative for about 18 months. Um, I would say that we had a lot of great success. Our staff was happier. We found that clients were recovering at a greater rate. And at that point, the system decided, San Francisco being the system, decided, you know what, maybe there's something here. Let's make a commitment as, as a system to hire a system-wide wellness and recovery coordinator. And I'm lucky enough to have gotten that job. And what I'm doing now is I'm actually taking the lessons that we learned at OMI Family Center, not only how to do the strengths assessment and the other tools that you're going to learn, but also how do you begin to change a culture? And I'm beginning to share those lessons with the help of some of my colleagues here at, at um, Central Administration as well. But we're taking it to other outpatient clinics, to our full service partnerships, even to the jail settings. And I really think that it's important to have somebody, whether it's at the clinic or on your team or as a system, a person who's going to be the holder of hope. And um, because you have to keep it alive. Otherwise, it's really easy for practices, approaches to go back to the status quo. And so I would say that we're making good progress. We're now working with 10 sites and uh, slowly you know, trying to tra transform each clinic and culture along the way. So I think that's our journey. <laughs> Thanks, Gloria. Thanks for um you know, kind of, you know, bring us a little bit of back to your experiences. Um, you know, in some ways, I think it, it sounds uh, really easy the way that you're talking about it, but there was lots of hard work that went into it, lots of learning along the way. Um, and that's really important, I think, for making any kind of systemic change is, is, um, is, is putting in that investment into it. So um, I, I encourage you all to, to keep learning how to use the strengths assessment, keep your questions, etc. cetera. Um, but I really want to kind of position again. Rick, before you go on, there's a question I think that's been uh, posed of Gloria. Okay. Uh, this sure. comes from Jeff, Jeffrey Kukral, and, and Gloria, he's asking, how did you stay focused on making the experience feel like a recovery system and not a business when the office staff was saying, thank you for choosing us? Oh, okay. So the question was, how do we make it seem like it was a personal experience? Well, we started, you know, actually that's a really good question because um, what we did is that during the intake process, we actually have um, peer support staff who were at the front desk. We had, a, we had a wonderful front desk staff. He's like a natural healer. And one of his jobs was not only to welcome people, but also to complete the payer financial information. And what he found when he was get, just getting that sort of routine stuff about insurance and income is that he found people were obviously really stressed out. Some of them would start to cry. And him kind of being a natural healer, he started to ask, hey, you doing OK? And are you going to be all right? And then he started to share a little bit of his story and just shared with them that, you know, hey, I used to be in, I used to be in, in where you are right now about five years ago before I really started working on my recovery. And he just shared a little bit and really tried, would always try to join with the, with the client. And, and it was from this, from his work here, it's just kind of, it was really an intuitive thing that this whole idea of really transforming our intake process. And after the appointment was given, when they would come back for the actual formalized assessment after going through our orientation, we 
it's really key for the staff just to be authentic and genuine and to really believe as a team that we can really help you and we're honored that you've chosen us. So I think if you look at the whole meta messaging from the clinic environment, from the way the, you know, the, um, the orientation process went, we had a whole you know, staff collaborated video which talked all about recovery and our belief in recovery. So kind of as the meta package, I think really sent the message that this was something different. So I hope that answers your question some. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Appreciate for you uh, answering that. So what I'm going to try to do now is, is take us from where we left off with the strengths assessment and now bring in the personal recovery plan and how you see these things fit together. The important thing to think about is that, you know, any of these tools <laughs> really need to be within a context and they need to all be pointing in a very specific direction. And so we're, we're, we're using this direction of this final destination of a journey or part of that journey and calling it recovery and trying to find out what is meaningful and important to people, help them to find this life that's uh, worth living, that's outside of the mental health system, that brings meaning and purpose and a positive self-identity to their lives. And so when you think about the tools, they're all trying to, in a sense, move us along towards this direction. And it all starts from that very point of engagement when we're talking with people. And you know, like Gloria mentioned, it, it could be that the very first person that talks to somebody um, as they come into a clinic. Um, but every time that we interact with somebody, um, it's an engagement opportunity to understand more about the lens that people use, uh, what's meaningful and important to them, um, to try to find alignment of where that we actually may have a role in helping them to, to build an environment of hope um, that we offer something that can help people move forward. And when we use these tools, um, you know, we talked before about that, you know, the, the tools are important, but it's what's behind the tools that's even more important. We talk about in the strengths model that the relationship is primary and essential. And, you know, it's, it's the good practitioner that's able to use these tools to use them as very key drivers in helping people move from that point of engagement into recovery. And so really the strengths assessment and the personal recovery plan are, 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 are two sides of the same coin. You know, it makes no sense to help people kind of think about uh, what's meaningful and important, um, some possibilities of where they may go in their life if we're not going to help people actually take some steps towards it. So it's very key in this. So, you know, as we're kind of putting all these pieces together, you know, you're going to kind of see a theme of, of how strengths model practice really works. And there's this continual attention that's paid to finding out what's meaningful and important to the person. And, and this is not a, just an intake responsibility or something that we do in the very beginning as we're doing in the strengths assessment. It's continual. Um, because what people find meaningful and important sometimes evolves or it changes or it goes down different paths. And we're always trying to find that alignment. You know, and for the people that we work with, there are going to be problems, barriers, and challenges. And they're not ignored in this model, but rather we view them in the context of how they impact those meaningful and important goals. So, you know, we want to try to find where we have a role in the goals that people have. So strengths are one way that we do this. It's the reason why strengths are identified so we can help people to see, you know, how they currently are able to even make forward movement in their life, even despite problems, barriers, and challenges, and then organize them and get them into a detailed, specific, more usable form so that we can help people apply those to achievement of goals or even removing barriers to the goals. But everything that we do in terms of our interventions have to be relevant to the person in relation to those goals. So we have to keep those things tied together. Even if we're doing medical necessary interventions, it still has to always be tied in that person's mind to what they find meaningful and important. And also have the needed involvement of a mental health professional. There's going to be lots of goals that people state for their recovery that we won't have an involvement in. So we're trying to narrow those things of where we actually have a role and how things, how we can play a role in their life. So how do we help people move towards their goal? We help them use the personal environmental strengths. But an important part is not just for us to recognize strengths, but helping people see these things um, so that they can impact um, their own recovery. The person that was sharing their example in the very beginning, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name, but... Um, you know, the person who sometimes could look at their own, they couldn't see their own strengths. And that's important is that we help mobilize people so they're making an impact in recovery. And then also helping people find this perfect niche because for goals that people have, it may not be that, you know, the, the, the whole entire community is where um, they'll be reaching out to. 
it's really finding where people have pockets of competency. Um, you know, I don't fit everywhere in the community, so and all of us are kind of like that. We have our niches, and the strengths assessment helps us to find those. So your documentation, when you pull all this together, is really a part of that evolving storyline. And we know that uh, it would be nice if people came in, they told us their goals, we started identifying strengths, we got out a personal plan, we made movement, but that evolving storyline means is that we may go in multiple directions. We may be taking a few steps forward, a few steps back, but always kind of staying in this whole narrative of helping a person be able to navigate their own world, seeing themselves as the person who can recover and helping them take steps. So here's the personal recovery plan. First of all, what is it? Um, we've, we talked about the personal recovery plan as this um, shared agenda or a roadmap. You, you could actually almost think of it as a ground level navigation system. Um, you know, not something like the treatment plan, which may be at a very higher level with more broader type goals. This really is the daily operations that really, in a sense, um, shows um, our uh, alliance with a person on a very meaningful and important goal and the beginnings of the commitment that we're willing to walk with them along that. And so if we use the personal plan regularly, then we're going to see that it starts to drive the nature of the work that we do, our activities and our interventions. And it doesn't mean that sometimes we don't pause for a minute when a person goes through a crisis, um, but what it means is that even as we help people you know, overcome a specific barrier, problem, or challenge, that we have something to go right back into. You know, what was the road that we were trying to travel? You know, what you're trying to do right now is to be able to better connect with um, your mom who, who, who can be a very a strong support for you or you know you're trying to be able to get a job or you're, you're trying to be able to keep and raise your two children um, so it keeps that always on the agenda is this is what we're trying to work towards even if there's things that that are there there's things that cause us to step back even at times an important thing about it is it helps us to celebrate even those smaller steps. You know, sometimes when a person has a goal to, to get a job or go back to school or um, to find someone uh, to be in a relationship with, you know, that can be a, a, a long um, and, and somewhat overwhelming or amorphous goal. And what we always find is that sometimes when we help people get in motion, that where we, we first point towards isn't where we always end up. And so there's so much about, you know, just looking at every step and celebrating along the way and making these decisions about where do we want to go in, 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 within our next steps in relation to, you know, what we just did on the last week or this week, et cetera. And it really helps us to be more purposeful and prepared for the work that we, we do with clients. And I think it's really important that, um, you know, that when we're actually going out to meet with people that we're not in this position of, of, of thinking of them just as our you know Thursday at 4 o'clock that we're really thinking about what am I going out there to do that particular day and even if that's not what actually ends up occurring you know you got with a person we were going to work on this goal and the personal recovery plan the person's out of food you know well you go take care of that you know let's help you be able to make sure that you got food in the house or or take care of some crisis that they might be having but then let's think about is that how do we get back into something purposeful so that we can help you take Take movement on your goal. You know, we, we spent a lot of time on Elizabeth's personal recovery plan last time, and um, now what I want to show you is her personal recovery plan. And for her, it really was wading into unknown waters because if you kind of remember the storyline on it, in the beginning, Elizabeth really had some questions about whether she could live on her own. Her mom wasn't completely supportive of it, and even the worker had some reservations about, you know, I, I don't know if she can do this, but I'm willing to go forward because I know it's meaningful and important to her. So that personal recovery plan, you know, when you, you write that goal at the very top, you know, I want my own apartment, you know, it doesn't mean that you guarantee that that's going to happen. What it is, it's a validation of this is what's important to you. And I think when you write down someone's goal, it's even more important to know the active ingredient behind that goal. Why is this important to you? Because sometimes the active ingredient is what the person's looking for even more so than the apartment. And that's very key language to try to elicit. So for Elizabeth was that, you know, I want to have this freedom. You know, I want to be able to prove that I can do this. And there's a lot more to that than just getting an apartment. But that's where we start because that's where she wants. So in Elizabeth, if you just kind of look at this very first part of it, um, you know, one of those first questions was is that is there even a place, is, is there even openings at the place that you want to look like uh, or you want to look at? And as you look at that, uh, you know, the steps one through ten on this very first page, they're all very simple, small, measurable action type 
sentences. You know, talk to the landlord and ask, fill out, make a list, talk to mom, go to. And so what you're trying to do is get these things into very small bites so that people can accomplish it between the next time that you get together or even at the next appointment that you're having. You know, so for Elizabeth, it's, it's, it's exploring. A lot of this was exploration. You know, what do we need to do next? You know, and, and these personal recovery plans can go on for many, many, many pages. In fact, you don't really stop doing them until either the goal is achieved or the person changes their mind. And we also mentioned that, you know, it wasn't just as simple as, you know, uh, accomplishing steps for Elizabeth. She had a lot of reasons why sometimes that things didn't go so well, like when she got her, when she got her apartment um, several years before that, and it only lasted for five months. But if you look just on this uh, second page here, you know, it's step 11 that it's, um, it's updating the crisis plan. You know, and Elizabeth was a person who, you know, hospital, I mean, it called the crisis line a lot. She was hospitalized pretty frequently. She had done crisis plans before. But the fact that, you know, now we're starting to enter a time where, you know, we're checking in on the apartment. We've done a lot of steps. She started to put some investment into it. Mom's starting to slowly get a little bit more behind it. But now it's like she's still on the waiting list and they may have an apartment in the next month and it's starting to get a little bit real. And so some of the conversations started shifting a little bit to, you know, so what are you going to do if you get into your apartment and all of a sudden you start to feel those uh, kind of feelings that you feel um, and you feel like you might want to harm yourself? What are you going to do? So the nice thing is that these are a lot easier to talk about when it's in that relevant context of something that's meaningful and important to her. Not, you know, let's do this to keep you out of the hospital. Let's do this so you feel comfortable keeping your own apartment. So those are a lot of the steps. One thing that you should probably um, know is that, you know, personal recovery plans are, can be just as messy as a strengths assessment. You know, they don't necessarily have to be typed up. We type this up just for um, illustration purposes, making sure that you can read it. But this original one, um, you know, just looked like anybody's handwriting. You know, it's really kind of messy and it went on for several, several pages. But I think before we really kind of talk even more about the personal recovery plan, I think it's really good for us to talk about, well, why aren't goals achieved in the first place? And, you know, here's a list of just, uh, you know, nine reasons, common reasons why people's goals are not achieved. There's lots more that can, to, can go on this list. But when you look at this is that uh, these are goals that really should be in common for any of us of why our goals are not achieved. There's not anything specific to mental illness. You know, and these are things that actually we can do something about. Uh, we can take some kind of action on. It's not because of illness necessarily. You know, one of those big ones is that it's not the person's goal. And, you know, when we become frustrated where that we have something on a treatment plan, you know, even sometimes we have a, people that will agree to a goal that's not their goal. And then we become frustrated when they're not actually making progress towards it. So how do we make sure that you know, it's the person's goal. Or if a person changes their mind, um, you'll see from the personal recovery plan that, you know, it's a lot easier to start finding when people start drifting from that, you know, this goal really, it was really important to me when we first started, but now it's kind of diminished over time. Or as people start to kind of look at the benefits and costs of achieving a goal, you know, it's kind of like even like with us is that, you know, you make those New Year's resolutions that, you know, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start exercising. And, you know, and, it, and you can think of all the benefits of why you want to do that. And then all of a sudden you get a couple weeks into it and it's like, wow, this is really hard work and it takes time out of my day. It competes with other priorities. And, well, maybe the costs don't outweigh the benefits or, or maybe they do. Um, you know, or too many goals where people start to kind of become a little bit, uh, you know, oversaturated, you know, so it's, you know, for most clients, uh, for any of us, you know, trying to focus on, uh, you know, eight to ten goals isn't always very easy. You know, we start to kind of drift away from those ones that aren't as important or exciting for us, and we stick with the ones that are. But this is important for us to kind of really get down to what are the reasons why the person you are working with is having difficulty with their goal and through their lens. And a lot of times what we do is that in, in, in mental health circles is sometimes we use a lot of words that are very unhelpful. And these are probably ones that you've seen before. You know, we get into a team meeting and we start to, to refer to a client as being non-compliant or unmotivated, um, low functioning, unre the goal is unrealistic or resistance. And, you know, I just want to challenge you to, to not go to these places. In fact, a lot of teams that... Um, we have they're implementing the model, um, we'll actually kind of choose words that they will just decide to ban from their team. Um, and, you know, things like this, like non-compliant. And, 
you know, we don't really view that in the strengths model that really there's really any non-compliant person. Um, you know, usually what it is is that they're very compliant with their own treatment plan, but not necessarily compliant with the one that's actually written uh, within our charts. And so, you know, trying to think about what are the internal drivers for a person, why they may choose to follow doing something versus wanting to do something else. You know, having that curiosity about, you know, why doesn't a person want to take a medication? And there's some fruitful discussion that's underneath it that's so much more complex than a simple statement like they're being non-compliant. Or even words like unmotivated, you know, in, in the model we actually just refuse to believe that there's anything or there's any such person as an unmotivated person. Um, I mean, unless the person's a corpse or they're in a coma, you know, we're always, uh, we're always up to something. It's, it's just the nature of being human. You know, I don't know if you've ever worked with a client before that um, would spend, like, say, the most of their, majority of their time you know, just sitting somewhere in isolation, smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, not really seem to be involved or invested in their selves or self-care or, um, or anything. And you know, we look at that person as maybe an unmotivated client, but the, you know, the first time that that person runs out of cigarettes, they could walk three miles barefoot in the snow to get that pack replaced. Well, that's highly goal-directed, motivated behavior. So it's not always a question of motivation. It's a question of is that what is the nature of that particular goal, why that person has difficulty mustering the energy to be able to do that. So I just want to say that just for any of these words as they're unhelpful, because these are words that really limit our ability to be creative and help people explore possibilities. So I just kind of wanted to put out there, because that's very central to deciding in a sense which goals we work on and how we in a sense go about that. So where do you get this goal that you're going to put on the personal recovery plan. Well, if you do a strengths assessment really well and you're using it to really truly understand the person and their perspective, you know, you're not writing about them, but you're helping them to, to in a sense, pull out their narrative about, you know, um, what drives them each day, you know, what do they do, um, what do they enjoy. Um, you know, if somebody's in their life, um, how is that person a strength to them? Or if there's something to do, understanding how that thing is something a strength. And what do they desire and aspire to? Or, you know, maybe even what did you desire and aspire to before you got very ill? So if you look at that, you know, strengths assessment and you look at that middle column, that's the aspirations column of the strengths assessment. And usually what we do is that, you know, after getting a lot of work on that, we can pull those down and really find out, you know, where the person wants to start first. You know, and even if it's not fully flushed out or, you know, it's still even at a vague point, it's that goal that we want to try to get onto the personal recovery plan. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more later about how that links to, like, say, the treatment plan as well. But it really needs to be in the person's own words. They need to see it. They need to feel it. Um, you know, it does nothing to pull the energy out of a person than to someone to say, you know, I'd like to get a girlfriend, and, and then we turn around and say, how does this sound? You know, increase socialization. You know, it's, it just takes all the uh, passion out of it. And we want it to sp specify it as precisely as that person understands it. Um, you know, if a person says they want a job, but there's a multiple reasons of why a person would want a job, and we really want to pull out that active ingredient. Why is this important to you? Well, I want to get a job because I want to be able to, to buy a motorcycle. Um, and it's not debated, but rather accepted and further explored. And um, if we get time, we may not do it actually in this session, but I do want to talk, or we may even do it through some question and answer at some point. Um, but, you know, this really takes uh, any type of goal, you know, even goals that sometimes we feel may be unrealistic or delusional. Um, at this point, we're not debating the goal, but we're accepting it and exploring it, and we'll come back to that. So here's some examples just of some recovery-oriented goals, and you know what's a recovery-oriented goal is that if when the person says it and they see it, there's some energy, some excitement that, you know, you can see a little bit shift in their, 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 their eyes, um, it lights up. You know, I want to keep my son because he's my purpose for living. Um, I want to get my own place where I can cook meals and have a pet for company. Um, want a job working with animals. Want friends so we can hang out together. You know, but these goals here just in isolation does not mean that we have a role into it. So it's important, you know, that we, we first of all, we don't even have to start with medical necessity. But let's just start with, you know, what, what moves you and, and what brings meaning and purpose to your life. And then we can kind of make some decisions after that. You know, with a lot of us, we may need to pair recovery-oriented goals with statements of medical necessity. 
and this is not to deny that you know um, on either end. It's not it's not to say that um, um, you know that a person's passionate goal um, you know. Uh, um, can't have medical necessity on it, or that something of medical necessity can't have some passion behind it, you know, because there always has to be that answer, that statement is that, well, what role do we have in it? When you think about goals that are going to end up going on a treatment plan, um, it's good sometimes to see that kind of pairing, you know, so you can take that one where about the person and their son, you know, I want to be able to better manage symptoms of depression so I can care for my son. Um, I want to be free of drugs and alcohol so I have more money to afford my own place to live, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's pairing those things together. Um, but most importantly, we do a good job sometimes of bringing out things like, you know, symptoms and, um, you know, get clean and sober. But we don't always necessarily do a good job of capturing the passion of why a person would want to do the hard work of doing those things. So not only do we have to understand if we have a role in a person's goal, but we also have to understand the pace. You know, um, is a person ready to make movement on a particular goal? You know, because just a person is passionate about something and vocalizes it does not mean um, that it's time to go. You know, um, a lot of you are familiar with the stages of change, and you know that was kind of come out of an, an addiction model, but it applies to a lot of things. You know, where that pre-contemplation is, you know, a person doesn't really have any reasons to make a change, or that contemplation, which is characterized by ambivalence, and you could use a scale. It's like I have some reasons why I might want to do something. Um, there's also things, reasons why I don't want to take a step in a certain direction. You know, going all the way up to action, going up to sustaining movement towards a goal. And you know we don't really want to use relapse so much uh, with goal attainment, but reevaluation I think is a very good word because no matter what goal we're doing, um, even our personal lives, we at times reevaluate: is this really what I want to do? Um, is it worth still putting the energy into it? Is this does it conflict with other things in my life that I value, etc.? But it's important to think about this because you know a person may have a you know I don't know if you've ever worked with someone who said you know I want to work, and so we immediately you know let's get you in to see the separate employment worker let's get you to start working and and then over time or the next few weeks we start seeing them miss appointments or you know have a reason you know okay I can't do that today or something came up that we need to go handle instead and you know after a while we're kind of questioning you know well do you really, do you want to work or not. And a lot of that is around mismatch of stage of change, you know, where, you know, we as workers, you know, we get so giddy when somebody has this action goal that it seems, you know, so we, we want to start taking movement on it when a person actually may be more in that contemplation point. So we need to make sure that we're slowing down enough to make sure that we're not getting ahead of a person. So when do you actually introduce this personal recovery plan? You know, with a strength assessment in, in most programs, you can do a strength assessment with almost anyone, um, and we encourage that. Um, but in terms of the personal recovery plan, you're not going to use it with every person. You know, obviously, if you're working with a person that you're still having difficulty engaging, you, you don't even know what's meaningful and important, well, you're probably back to that stage of engagement, trying to learn more about what they find meaningful and important. I don't expect to see that you would have a personal recovery plan for that person. But when do you start bringing it out to make movement? Well, you introduce it when, you know, a person has identified a passionate goal and they want help achieving it. So not only do they want to do something, but there's a role for you in it. You know, I want to get a job so I can better support my family, and you have a role in that. Um, or even if it's not this huge, huge passionate goal, but it's a goal that would be more likely achieved if it was broken down into smaller steps. You know, um, sometimes they can be a little bit more vague. You know, I want to meet someone who I could go out and do things with. Well. That's a pretty overwhelming goal for a lot of us. You know? um, so now the, the feeling is that, you know, where do we start? Can we just break this down into some small steps just to get movement? But you can even use the personal recovery plan to begin to explore. Like when you've got a person in that contemplation stage or very unclear about what they want, I just don't want to feel the way I'm feeling now. I just want to be happy. I just want to do something. Um, it's fine to go ahead and lead off with those. And then you can refine them more over time. So there's some critical components to what's going to be on this personal recovery plan in terms of the content. You know, obviously it always has to have that goal. It has to be relevant to the person. Um, but also it has to have a statement of that active ingredient. I think that's just completely critical. You know, I want to prove I can do something. Um, I want people to accept me. I'm tired of feeling lonely. These are good statements to have out. And then those small measurable steps that can be accomplished either 
at the next meeting with the person um, or during that next meeting. So the goal you're going to see here in a little bit is that you just want movement. So let me just give you a quick example of this. This is a, a personal recovery plan on a different person. You know, once again, it's, it's typed up um, only for your, the readability of it. But you know, in some instances, is that you only need one step or two steps to get movement. Um, and that's a lot of times where it starts. You know, so for this particular person who has this goal where they want to they better control the voices in their head so that they feel comfortable going out in public. You know, and you can even make this as much specific as you want to. You know, define what's going out in public mean to you. Well, for starters, it's like I don't even feel comfortable going to the grocery store. You know, so you can even refine that more. But really, you want the person to define this. You know, staying with them, keeping aligned. The main thing is that ingredient. I just want to feel and be a part of things. You know, it doesn't make any sense for a person to, uh, you know, to meet a goal of, you know, hey, I can go to the grocery store and back, but they still don't really feel a part of things. So understanding that is just as important as the goal. Um, but here's where, you know, just a few steps were kind of put out on this. You know, let's up, just, you know, let's just update the strength assessment and just see what you've done in the past to help with voices. Um, you know, maybe we can spend some time identifying triggers. You know, when's it, when do you seem to feel worse hearing voices? For, um, versus other times, and so you know you got some comments on there, um, etc. But then this is the next time that they're getting together, and what you're seeing here is that um, you're adding to it. So some of those things like taking the group uh, step three, taking the strength assessment to group supervision, now has a date accomplished on it. Um, you know you've added a few things. Um, so for example, number five actually comes out of something that's very relevant to the person. So not only do they feel alone, they feel more voices are bad when um, they're alone or they feel stressed, but if you saw this person's strengths assessment, you would also see that they like animals. And so it's really nice when you're starting to look for these niches. And so that kind of led to this. Another thing is that this person on their strengths assessment, they also um, knew how to use a computer. So that was something that they wanted to look at, you know, look into this voice here support group. Um, yoga and meditation is something that the person um, was interested in, you know. And it doesn't matter if sometimes, you know, this person, you know, goes down a path of yoga and meditation and says, you know what, I tried that and I don't like it. It's really more important that there's movement than there's really anything else. Um, you know, and that's why always is these things are wading into the unknown, letting the storyline evolve. Um, so on that, um, you know, when I think about just movement, you're just going to keep seeing that. Every time it goes together, there's movement. Um, and that's how you know that whether you're on the right goal or you're really kind of aligning with shared decision making with a person on the direction to go. You know, when I think about things that disable people in mental health programs, sometimes it's not even the symptoms. Sometimes it's the fact of inertia. You know, when you've got a person that's kind of just given up or they've kind of resigned over to the mental health system, um, for me, it's like if we can get people in motion, that's a very powerful thing. You know, not letting people just kind of sit in their own thoughts for long periods of time, you know, stressing about everything in the past and how can we get movement? And not only just, you know, any movement, but movement where people feel support, they feel like that what they're branching off is to something where they feel confidence or some competence or that they're at least getting enough support for you to be able to venture out and try a step. So that's what keeps happening. These can continuously go on and on once again until that goal is either accomplished um, or the person changes their minds. And so every time that a goal is accomplished, you know, this question is, is that where do you want to go from here? So we're going to do shared decision making um, in the next uh, webinar that we do, but it really is every time is that time of shared decision making. You know, it's like, um, so you found out from the landlord that you could get a small dog and it's going to be a $100 pet deposit. What do you want to do with that? Um, you know, I know you say you like big dogs, but is it worth it to maybe pursue a dog under 20 pounds? Um, you know, do you want help exploring options of how you might be able to pay that pet deposit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one thing that you're probably having some questions on is then how does this PRP link with the treatment plan? Um, there's all kinds of ways that you could look at this, but, um, you know, I always see this treatment plan as this overarching type of roadmap that's kind of giving you an idea of where you're going. 
Um, and sometimes a treatment plan goal can be a goal that, you know, it may take over a course of a year or even a couple years um, to accomplish. You know, like a person who says, you know, I wanted to get a job or I want to get a degree or I want to get into a relationship or I want to get uh, clean and sober from, from drugs and alcohol. You know, I want to be able to really know how to be able to self-manage anxiety. I mean, no matter what it is, the treatment plan kind of points you in a direction but this personal recovery plan is something that is not necessarily, you know, written for the chart. It's not, um, you know, when I think about the personal recovery plan, I mean, the, the treatment plan, I think it is being kind of primarily written for our funding sources and even internally within the program, um, primarily. It doesn't mean that a client, you know, can't enjoy what's on their treatment plan. I mean, hopefully they would look at it and say, yeah, that's, that's my goal. Uh, but the personal recovery plan really is that tool that's on the ground with them um, that's really for the client. The client owns it. Um, it's their goal. It's their steps. Um, but it's, it's an agenda that allows you to kind of stay focused in is that where are they going and where do they want your support, et cetera. And, you know, if barriers or problems occur along the way, then how do we go about that, you know? It's, um, you know, now that we found out that you're not going to be able to get an apartment at this place for whatever reason, what do you want to do? You know, do we want to do some advocacy type stuff? Do we want to look at a different apartment? Do we want, you know, there's a range of options, but keeping the person in control of this is your goal in your life, and how can I support you to be able to do that? So, so let me just stop here real quick and just ask, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff just really quick, but I just want to see if any of you have any specific questions that are arising after talking about this particular tool. Uh, yeah, Rick, I'm going to read one that came in from Sherry Abassi from MHAOC. Um, hang on, I just had it in front of me. She was asking about treatment plan goals, and she said, Let's see. Can Rick speak to how to use the PRP to support in writing a client-centered and strength-based treatment plan with goals and objectives and friends? And she was looking for some examples. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of how to just do it very simplistically. You know, when I think of, of a goal that goes on the treatment plan, you know, any goal, I think it has to have a few elements. You know, um, you know, one is that it needs to actually somehow be, like if a client looked at it, they would see what they specifically want that's meaningful, important in that language. You know, so a person coming out and saying that, you know, I want to be able to keep my son. You know, then a question is always comes out is that, well, what role do we have in that? Do we have a role? Um, are there things that might have, that are impeding your ability to do that, that we could actually help you with? Now, there's a few ways you can do it. I mean, one, you could pair something, you know, like right inside of, of that goal that links, you know, I want to be able to do this so that I can keep my son. But sometimes you can also do it within goals and objectives. You know, because maybe there's several different areas that you might be able to help um, a person with. You know, maybe learning specific parenting skills, or you know, being able to. You know, a per, one, you know, um, I remember working with a person who um, who lost her kids after multiple suicide attempts, and so trying to put an objective that really kind of went all the way back in that timeline about, you know, um, what are what are t times when you start. Can you even get some awareness about times when you start seeing yourself go down, when you start feeling suicidal, you know? So, I mean, can we just start sometimes in objectives at that very small level of just, um, you know, can we do something about even identifying triggers, you know, and then maybe try to develop some solutions or, you know, some strategies from there. So then when you think about the personal recovery plan, it might be pulling one of those objectives completely down and say, now, this is, where do we want to start? What is something that we want to do today or maybe between now and the next time that we get together um, that, that we can do, you know, so that it's not like this overwhelming thing like, gosh, you've got to master everything within this next uh, month. Um, you know, how do we, where do we start? You know, sometimes there's going to be lots of goals that we don't even really kind of know exactly where, 
we're going to start. So sometimes it's just admitting to a person that, you know, I don't know where this is going to go, but I'm willing to walk alongside you. And really that's what that personal recovery plan is, um, is to help them to do that. I don't know if that helps, um, but I might be able to write out some other examples, um, you know, between now and the next time we get together. Um, okay, we're going to have to work, work on some of those examples. We had a similar question, a related question from Tom Orak, and he asked, if you recognize that clients make goals, but are stuck in a pattern of not achieving them, do you ever review them or adjust them to allow for greater success? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, um, I, you know, I, I worked with one person that, um, you know, just was constantly kind of switching a goal of, um, you know, where that they wanted to live. And, um, you know, after kind of, you know, switching like about four different times, you know, then, you know, finally, you know, uh, keeping all those personal recovery plans together, but I think sometimes that's a conversational piece is that, you know, I don't know if I'm really helping you all that much, you know, it seems like we've done some work here and, um, you know, it's, it's, I know it's, it seems very difficult for you to think about, you know, this decision that you're making and maybe trying to get underneath some of that stuff. But sometimes just the evidence of putting it out there, if you're doing that right with the person, you know, it's just kind of pointing to that, you know, that, um, you know, trying to find what is it? Is is, is there fear behind it? Um, is it that, you know, the, the person, but you sometimes even, you know, I'll just give an example, another one where, you know, I had a person that um, had a goal of employment and I was all excited about it and we tried to um, help this person get into different things. Um, it was that one of those examples of where it seemed like she was sabotaging everything. Um, and then we kind of, you know, sat down and she starts crying. I asked her what was wrong and, sh and she said, I really don't want to work. And I was like, oh, you know, Carol, why, how did you tell me? And she just said, I, I, thought it, I thought it was something that was important to you. You know, so sometimes by using that personal recovery plan, it's just that, you know, we can stop back and just, you know, boy, I, I, I really didn't see that and I'm sorry. You know, do we need to refine this? And, you know, where do you want to go? Um, so it is. I, I think it, it is. It's, sometimes it's constantly renegotiating that goal or coming back and still finding out whether that goal still holds the same importance or what might be behind a person, um, you know, not being able to carry out a step. Is it that they don't know how to do it? Um, so do, do we need to get steps smaller um, or does they feel they don't have the, the confidence to do it and so they need more support around how to do that? Um, it just opens up a lot of discussion. And it, doesn't, and it doesn't necessarily blame the person for anything. It's just that, you know, how do you want to go about this step? Do you want to do it yourself? Do you need support around it? You know, and then you try to do something and just see how it went. And if it doesn't go well, then where do we want to go from there? You know, but a question always is, is that, is this still your goal? And if it is, well, then let's kind of think about other ways that we might be able to approach this or change the goal. Okay, I know we have, uh, we have to move on, but I did want to uh, share a part of a, a, a multi-level question from Michael Lisman, and mm -hmm. he's asking quite a few questions, but um, one of them is, how, how do you select which clients to use the strengths model um, and, the, you know, and the pieces of the strengths model? Well, I always think, you know, in, in any program that I've done, um, it's been everyone. And I, that's how we do it within the teams that we implement. You know, we've got about, about uh, you know, well over half now of all um, case management teams in Kansas who are doing the model. And of course, we, you know, we track outcomes um, and movement all through this. And, you know, we never encourage um, to self-select, but rather it's like um, you do it with everyone. You do that approach. Now, you learn sometimes by learning with just a few people. Um, and that's a way of, you know, just gathering your skills and sometimes it's even, you know, when I say starting to use a strengths assessment or even a personal recovery plan, start with somebody who you have a great relationship, somebody you know has a goal, somebody that you know has some passion about moving forward and use that to start learning the tool. But ultimately, you know, you want to be in that place where it's like, you know, everybody's at a different stage of recovery and these tools can work. But you have to really think about when do you introduce it? When is the context right? Do we have the right relationship with that person? But, but we don't give up on it. So even if you're not using the tools, you're still using the model because you're still in that whole constant curious about, you know, why does this person sit constantly and smoke cigarettes? 
Um, you know, not not that you know, not that it's just about stopping cigarettes. It's just that, but why why have they given up? You know, why why do they seem to to not be invested in anything about uh, moving their life beyond this mental health system? And by becoming curious and willing to invest, um, eventually we will start opening some of those doors. So I'm going to move on quick to Allie because Allie's going to give even some more uh, practical examples. And you know, in the last uh, uh, webinars, we always operated through an actual case example. And so that's what Allie's going to do is just take you about how this tool was used and use a, an actual example. So Allie, you're up. Hi, thanks, Rick. Um, so I just quickly want to run through how the personal recovery plan was used between a worker and this person uh, named Mike um, here in Kansas. Um, unlike many of the clients who first um, come into the mental health system, Mike came in to case management services with many resources already. And the worker really does a nice job of capturing everything um, that he already has on his strengths assessment, which we'll look at in just a minute. However, she's pretty immediately challenged with trying to help determine a direction for their work together. Um, and she could easily make the mistake of assuming he's much further along in the recovery process because of what he already has. So he has a job already, he has a car, he has a place to live, he has a few friends, and he has a cat that he's very fond of. Um, he alludes to feeling somewhat depressed, but really isn't comfortable initially with talking with her in any depth about that. But as the relationship with Mike and her uh, progresses over a few sessions, he finally discloses that he feels very alone and isolated and that he constantly hears negative messages about himself. And the messages are uh, re primarily related to being a bad father. He's kind of lost track and contact with his son um, who lives in another state. That, that he's a bad son to his mother who also lives in another state because he's not near her to take care of her. Um, even though he's had 36 jobs over the course of his life, he constantly thinks about um, that he's lost as many jobs as he's had as many jobs. Um, and the, just the constant feeling that things are never going to get better for him. He spent a lot of time worrying about how he was going to lose everything that he has, and he feels as though it could all just come crashing down on him at any moment. He's a pretty high risk for suicide, and the worker is anxious to find something that they can work toward together in order to help. So fast forward to today, Mike has lost 25 pounds, he got his knee replaced, found a girlfriend who he met in a cooking class, and they take walks every day. The two of them plan to visit his son in Washington State this summer, and he's still working part-time, but his hours have increased, which he really likes. He absolutely fell in love with the concept of personal medicine, which I think Rick has already presented on. Um, but he now views simple things uh, like playing his guitar, taking care of his cat, and traveling around with his new girlfriend as his own uh, unique strategies um, or ways of combating the negative things that he still occasionally hears about himself. So here's a, a nice, messy strengths assessment, which I don't know if any of you can see, but again, the worker just did an incredible job in this um, situation of really capturing uh, very unique things about Mike and a lot of what he already has, like I said, and what's working well for him. You can't really see, but he's also identified many, many aspirations in that middle column of things that he wants to work on. Um, so she kept going back to the strengths assessment in those first initial um, appointments with him um, and kept developing the relationship. And like I said, he identified many things he wanted, such as getting a new apartment, saving money, filing for bankruptcy, going back to church. Um, but when the, as they talked about it, he basically said those were things that he could do without her help. And so that kind of goes again back to the point Rick was making earlier that just because somebody identifies something that they want to work on, it doesn't always mean that there's a role for a mental health worker to jump in there and get involved. And I see workers make that mistake a lot. And sometimes what it ends up happening then is when we're always leading with a solution, uh, people very quickly become dependent upon us to provide solutions in most of the situations in their life. So it kind of sets the worker up for that. Um, so back to Mike. 
once he finally disclosed the intensity of the negative messages that he hears, the worker offered that she could help him explore different ways of addressing the messages. Um, he was initially hesitant, said he'd already tried everything he could think of, but he kind of reluctantly agreed to give it a try. So she introduces the personal recovery plan and explains that it might be helpful um, to track what helps combat the negative messages. And so they talk about it for a bit and then uh, together they come up with a goal. And the goal is to find enough positive things about myself and my life to keep going. Um, and I want to be able to love myself. So this is a good example of using a personal recovery plan for exploratory or introspective purposes versus using one to achieve something uh, that's really more tangible like um, searching for a job or locating a place to live. It really also begins to address what Mike views as his barrier to everything, the negative messages he hears about himself and potentially offers him some hope that he might be able to start chipping away at those. And I think that's a nice, again, illustration of the worker really understanding Mike's worldview and what he sees as barriers, um, things getting in the way for him to make forward movement. Um, so once they were able to articulate the goal, the worker asked Mike if he'd be willing to try just two things before they met again. And you can see on the personal plan what those two things were. So she offered um, a mood log worksheet that he could use uh, during the week to simply track times when he feels positive or negative. And then when he identifies that he's having negative thoughts, just to simply write down uh, what he was thinking at the time. And so right off the bat, two steps, that's all she asked him to do. He was agreeable to doing it. Um, and I think it's important to note um, that, I'm sorry, I. I'm jumping too far ahead. Let me back up for a minute. Um, so quickly, just if you'll take a look at the remaining steps. Um, so she goes back in this is the next appointment and um, asks again, would you be willing just to go through the list of negative messages, check the facts, and write possible reframes? So um, when, you, when you've identified what the negative message is, let's assess what the actual facts are around, are you really a bad father, you know, you've kept contact with your son, do you want to increase contact with your son? So helping him start to think about rewriting his narrative when it comes to that. And then uh, using affirmations uh, that she and he created uh, during an appointment, putting those around his apartment, and then the step is simply to learn one mindfulness strategy. So as you can see, this is the very beginning of a personal recovery plan for Mike, and it certainly um, involved many, many, many more steps. But again, as you can see, they're small, um, they're simple, they're easy steps that he can take basically either between appointments with the worker or together with her. Um, so Mike had also indicated to the worker that he was feeling really overwhelmed by uh, many health problems. So he has a bad knee, he's overweight, problems with cholesterol, and a very poor diet. And he was feeling pretty paralyzed and like he couldn't do anything about that. So then the worker offered that they could try using another personal recovery plan to see if it would help break everything down into smaller steps. And he again agreed to give it a try. Um, so it's important to note here that most workers just use one personal recovery plan at a time, and that plan generally has a, a large overarching recovery goal that you could fit many steps under. But it's often helpful to have separate plans when you've got a more exploratory goal, <clears throat> like um, Mike's goal to combat the negative voices. So you could potentially have two personal recovery plans going at the same time. You obviously want to be careful with that. You don't want to overwhelm people. You might just decide to work on one personal recovery plan one week and then the next week work on the other. Um, so for this uh, PRP, the goal is simply to be more healthy as the way I feel impedes the way I think about myself, and that's not good right now. Again, only one step was identified at first, and that was simply to call Hy-Vee and get information on the nutrition program.
And then you can see in the comment section uh, that he found out that it costs $30 and that it sounds great, but he kind of wants to wait for now. So then the next step is identified, uh, get on the internet and see what cooking classes are available in the community. A date to be accomplished is set. The next step, and you can see the variation in the dates, of dates to be accomplished, that these are pretty much being set at each appointment. Try out a stationary bike in the activity room and see if it's something that he wants to do. And then the last step is to walk uh, two times this week. So again, <clears throat> you can see that these were only the starting points for Mike and his worker, but as they were used over time and at most contacts, Mike was able to slowly develop strategies for combating the negative messages. He also gained a huge appreciation for the use of personal medicine, and he made a lot of progress on addressing his health concerns, which in turn really helped him also address um, get some of those negative messages that he was constantly receiving. So I want to talk briefly now about how to go about documenting this type of an intervention. And I believe Rick has talked before about the GURP acronym. So uh, the goal, the intervention, the response, the plan, and then any important observations that have relevance to the person's goal or well-being. I think what's important to point out here is simply using the personal recovery plan at most appointments, when you have a goal, you're not always going to have a reason to use a personal recovery plan, but when you do, it makes writing a progress note or doing your documentation so simple because you simply start by stating the overall goal that you worked on. So here you can see that they met at the office to continue working on decreasing symptoms of depression and learning how to stay healthy and positive. And then if you look at the intervention, um, basically what the worker describes here is essentially what they negotiated around the personal recovery plan. Of course, they're doing some assessing around client safety, making sure he's not suicidal, but then moves right into talking about introducing a mood log um, and also starting to address the health goal. So a brief response, um, how the client responded um, to the intervention, and then the plan is simply what are the next steps on the personal recovery plan? Again, that's why you want to keep the steps kind of small um, and you want to make sure that the person feels pretty confident that they'll be able to achieve them before uh, your next contact with the person. So what's needed to make the PRP work? Um, again, Rick talked about they work best when you're working with a client who has a passionate goal um, or at least a goal uh, where it would benefit to have it broken down into smaller steps. It's really important to be able to listen, engage where the person is in their stage of change related to the goal. I constantly, when I'm out doing field mentoring uh, with case managers around use of the PRP, I like to not only gauge where the person is in this uh, stage of change process on the overall goal, but I like to do that for each step that we kind of negotiate with the person. So I might ask the, the client, you know, would you be willing to track your mood by using the mood log uh, between now and the next time I see you? And they might say, sure. And then I might say, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how confident? are you that you'll be able to do that you know, on a pretty regular basis before I see you again. And really, if they're anywhere uh, below an 8, I tend to sit back down and say, maybe that step is just too big, and maybe we need to break it down even further. Um, so paying attention to where people are in the stage process is critically important. Um, if the steps are too big, if they're too broad, if they're ongoing, um, if it's the same step over and over and over, the client and the worker are going to become very frustrated with using the tool. Um, a lot of patience is absolutely required when using this tool. Um, and it's important to remember it's an iterative, iterative continual process. And Rick 
mentioned that earlier, the importance of revisiting the goal often, making sure it's still relevant, making sure it's still meaningful, making sure it's still something somebody wants to do. Sometimes as people make progress on that overarching goal, it opens up other opportunities or other ideas they have. Or sometimes people just change their mind. Um, I find when using the PRP with people who have been maintained in services for years, um, that when you, you you have a goal and you start working with them on the PRP, sometimes the reaction is, oh, you're really going to be checking in with me, uh, you know, a lot about this goal, and I wasn't really serious, and so we need to kind of break it down even further. So. Uh, all you need is a step to get to the next appointment. You we're just looking for tiny, tiny movement. Rick's moving me on quick, so I'm moving. Um, <clears throat> supervisor's role is critical when using the PRP. I, I think for me, probably the most important thing I want to say to you if you're going to encourage staff to start using this tool, it, it looks so simple. It's like a basic to-do list. And I see more staff struggle with this one tool than I do anything else. So I'd really encourage you, if you're going to test it, to again, pick one person on somebody's caseload who has a goal. Uh, they're kind of enthusiastic and ready to get moving on it. And to really provide a lot of support and feedback to the worker um, around using that tool. It's important that workers kind of learn how to use the tool correctly and a high level of quality before you push them to really start widely using the tool with a lot of people on their caseload. Um, field mentoring really is the best method that I've found anyway for helping the workers kind of build their skills around using the PRP, but group supervision can also be very helpful. Um, basically to come in and strategize for next steps on a PRP or how to hit on a meaningful goal. I also find it helpful if somebody has a PRP um, going with a person, if they're gonna come in and present a strengths assessment, bring the PRP into group supervision too. A lot of the supervisors here in Kansas will give feedback on the spot during group supervision about the PRP. Um, finally, uh, just before I hit on this last point, uh, Rick, I think another great way that I've seen uh, people become proficient in using the PRP is to use one for yourself. Um, I've done plenty for myself. Rick has tons going on himself all the time. But with workers, sometimes I'll ask them, you know, do you want to learn how to use this tool? They'll either say yes, they'll say no. If it's yes, then uh, we basically work on a PRP around them learning to use the tool. And that can be very, very helpful. Um, so why do you want to use this tool or why should you even consider using this tool? Um, so if you have a lot of people that you're working with um, who set goals but are having difficulty achieving them, this is a great tool for that. Uh, you feel like sessions with clients are more reactive uh, versus purposeful, so you're just kind of showing up kind of planning in the moment with people. You want to get more aligned with clients in their recovery journey um, and to make your role more supportive and more clear. I hear from clients all the time that they love this tool because it keeps their workers on track. It reminds their workers of what's important to them and kind of what they've agreed to help them with. Um, and finally, if you find yourself questioning if you really are making a difference in the lives of the people you serve, this is a living, breathing document that you're seeing week after week after week. And um, generally, once people hit their stride with using this tool and clients find it helpful, you're going to quickly be able to see uh, the amount of progress that people are making. Thanks, Allie. appreciate uh, um, you kind of walking all that through with us. But and I want to just open it up uh, in general to questions that you may either have for Allie or myself just about the use of the personal recovery plan. Uh, there was a question that came in earlier from <coughs> excuse me, Elizabeth Owens. And she asked, can you share how you would use this when working with teens? How do you incorporate the teens and parents' desires into a goal? That can get complicated, obviously, when uh, maybe the the teenager has a goal that the parent disagrees with. So 
working with teenagers in general with this model, I find that it's really important to um, involve the parents in discussions about why we use the tools and ultimately what we're hoping to do with them. So we do a lot of negotiating um, around goals. Um, we do a lot of, if, if the worker feels strongly that this is a goal that's safe for the teenager to go after, um, we might do a lot of discussion with the parent around what would it take for you to feel comfortable uh, for us to start taking some tiny steps toward this goal. Um, teen, teenagers love it, uh, especially when they are starting to make progress on something that a parent wants to see them making progress on because it's written on a piece of paper and they can kind of show it to the parents. Um, but honestly, working with teens using this tool and even the strengths assessment, it is, it's a different approach. It's a more nuanced approach. You have to think of more uh, developmental uh, strategies, uh, basically. Thank you. We, we also had a question about um, dates. And um, Sherry Abassi asks, how would you approach a case where clients are not meeting the date set on the piece of a PRP to reach a step? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> a lot of times I like to just lead by taking responsibility with, I wonder if I'm setting these steps too big, um, or maybe this isn't something that you want to work on anymore, maybe it's more, it seems like it's more important to me than you. Um, that tends to basically provide a safe opportunity for the, the person to kind of, a lot of times they will either say, you know, this really isn't, like Rick said, something that I even want to be working on. Um, or I've lost hope related to it, can we slow down a little bit? Um, so it's just staying curious about it, um, staying non-judgmental about lack of progress toward a, a goal, um, offering maybe to just set the personal recovery plan aside for a week or two and then come back to it. Um, maybe going back to the strengths assessment to see if there's anything else they've identified that maybe uh, the, the client feels like uh, they might could make some movement on. Um, so there's really no right, well, there is a wrong way. I mean, you definitely don't want to get into, why aren't you doing this? <laughs> you know, the blaming. None of you would do that, of course. But um, it's, it's truly just meant to guide the work, and it's meant to be negotiated constantly between the worker and client. So if they're not making movement, the conversation is really about why, and it's also okay that they're not making movement. Excellent. Rick, anything you might add to that or to other questions that have come in? Um, no, I can't think of it. Okay. So we don't have any more questions at this time. One of the things I didn't mean to mention at the beginning of this session is uh, the questions that we didn't have time to answer in session number two, uh, Rick did prepare some written responses, and you should have received those by now. Uh, I think you'll find them very helpful as it relates to uh, some great questions about how to use strength assessments, um, and he's, he was able to go um, into some pretty good elaboration. Uh, I, I wonder at this point if there's any more questions about the treatment plan. Uh, Sherry, I'll take Sherry Abassi, I'll take you off. Uh, mute real quick in case you might want to ask any more questions about that. Um, no, I think we're good. Thank you. Excellent. Very good. Okay. So um, since I'm not seeing any more questions coming in, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, you're always welcome. You've got our email addresses, you know, mine and, and Sharon, to so send questions that, that come up after the fact. Uh, but we will uh, work in questions that have come up that we weren't fully able to address today into future sessions. So we know that, that where content that's important to you needs to, to be explored more thoroughly, we will do that uh, um, in three more sessions. But as, as um, we suggested, some of the best way to get answers to your questions is to try it. So if you, um, that still is holding true for the strength assessment, hopefully you heard some stories today about uh, the success and the discovery of the value of the strength assessment. So if you haven't tested that yet, it's a wonderful thing to just go try. It's pretty, pretty low risk to give it a try. And similarly, if you've got clients who, or even a single client, as um, Ali is suggesting, 
has a, a, a goal, they're pretty motivated, that's a great place to start and get some experience working on a, a personal recovery plan. So um, give it a go. You know, this doesn't mean that you're making any uh, permanent commitments, you're just getting some experience with it. We'd love for you to email us your comments and feedback about anything that you try out, especially because that helps us know how to shape our content to support your continued learning around this. Uh, moving then and thinking about the next session, Rick already suggested this, we're going to be focusing on shared decision making, which is a theme that's essentially built into the, the strengths model and, and it's been a reference in many respects already, but we'll be talking deeply about shared decision making, especially related to medication, but not necessarily just that. So that's um, a, a month from now, April 6th, um, same time, 12 to 1.30. Uh, we'll be really focusing, as you look farther down the line, in session five at achieving goals and advancing recovery. So trying to bring the, the big picture together in session five around individual progress and how do you deal when things are getting stuck and it just gets tricky because uh, we know that, we, that there's a lot to be learned about all the nuances of, of having success with the strengths model and helping clients make progress and, and have the lives of their choosing. And then finally, session six, we're, we're really going to be looking at the big picture, as well as thinking about how does this big picture support folks uh, and your system design to support folks to actually ultimately leave the system. No longer need the support of the system, but have achieved enough in, uh, independence that they can have supported recovery in their communities. So that's that where we're headed. Um, if there are any particular questions or areas in which um, you'd like more information, that you've heard about, please let us know. Um, one particular question I do want to point out that folks asked last time was related to a Spanish strength assessment, and we have shared the version that came out of Kansas uh, in Rick's response to the question about the Spanish assessment. Uh, we have experience in California that uh, it is very regional. Um, and those of you that are seeking the Spanish assessment probably know full well that um, one translation from one area isn't necessarily going to be the best for your area. So you've got a starting point with the strength assessment uh, from Kansas in Spanish, but do anticipate uh, that you'll want to review it and change out some of the languaging uh, so it's more regional appropriate for you. Um, and on that note, uh, Rick or, or Ali, Gloria, any final thoughts from you all? Okay. Uh, all right, well, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. It's, it's just about 1.30. Oh, Gloria, were you going to say something? Uh, no, nothing for me. Okay. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Allie, and thank you, Rick. Thank you all for your presentations and uh, participants for your great questions. And we look forward to April 6th and uh, the shared decision-making conversation. Have a great day.